we're continuing our series on, on desire. We're running a lottery as to who can guess what that acronym is standing for. Uh, there is a free coffee attached to whoever can work out what D-E-S-I-R-E is. Today we unlocked the D and um, I had about 15 or 20 attempts last week. There was only one got it right. I was amazed they got it right because we've been deliberately cryptic in it. So um, let's hope someone figures it out. Work on the D today, see if you can find the D. But as we, as we go through this sort of series, it's, it's, it's always amazing when we think of this church and any church pastor, there's just so much going on in people's lives. There's the narratives in our heads that, we, that are lingering, that, that sit there, and, and every week, there wouldn't be a week go past where I'm aware that we have a message that we bring, we have a service format, we do our stuff. But I'm very aware of the reasons people come here is, is for that, but, but they're also... We have this load of stuff that's going on in our minds residually, isn't it? It's like if you scratch below the surface just a little bit, or even if you go even deeper than that, we'll, our minds will drift to certain things and, and the things that we struggle with, our, at the pressures of life, the, the internal self-critique that goes on in so many lives. And we, uh, we have uh, a prayer team that intercedes throughout the week for us. And uh, I, I was just interested this week as uh, the words of knowledge come from that about how we can be ministering into our church today. A, a consistent little message was coming through about that, the, the, the sense of lingering um, struggle that many of us go through as we weigh up how we're going in life. And for some of us, it doesn't feel like we're going that well. We're functioning, we're doing this stuff, but, you know, if we scratch just below the surface, there's self-doubt, there's, there's depression wanting to sneak in, that vortex, that black hole of anxiety can be ever before us. There's a, there's a sense that we don't measure up, that I'm just tired, I mean, what are we doing here? What, what am I living for? And most of us, when our head hits the pillow or we get these quiet moments in our life, we'll have seasons where we go through that. And I'm hoping even this message today and the, and the messages like it in the, in the following weeks will give you a chance to reset a little bit from that because his, his yoke is light. His, his calling is simple on our life. It's a simple, devoted relationship where we can come before him and that sense of condemnation of all the things that we're aware of where we haven't performed well, he just looks us in the eye and goes, it's okay, you're forgiven and it's okay and we're doing this thing together and I'm, I'm not going anywhere. And just that, how that lightens the load of our shoulders for life, that we can focus on one thing. And today's message in itself, as the Lord ministers to us in his spirit, because the only genuine ministry that goes on here is what the Lord does in our hearts himself. Preferably while I'm talking, he's doing that. You know, if you only meet me today, you're going to be disappointed. But if we come here expectant that God wants to do and can do and will do a work in our hearts, anything's possible. So we've started this series called A Growing Desire. And the reason I prayerfully went here for the next six weeks, and I understand six weeks is a, that's a lump, that's a, that's a, that's a weighty, series is because this is the single most important thing for us to be focusing on right now, I I sense, as as a congregation. We've had conversations about going out and we'll be doing that and we won't be changing that subject. And yet when it boils all down to it, we can be doing the works of God, we can be following the words of God, but if we haven't got a sense of wonder about that, if our hearts aren't being fueled before we are getting sent out on mission, then it's not going to last for long. It's not going to bear much fruit. And so when, G- when Jesus was confronted all the time consistently about what's the most important thing, it was desire for God, seek God, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength and mind. But for some of us, that's hard to plug into the side of an already busy life. Perhaps that's why it doesn't work for us, because we're trying to plug God in to the side of a very busy life. Oh, hey, we're committed, but we, we've got like, we talked last week about dog and cat theology. Um, the most memorable part of the message apparently was that, that too many of us are a bit like cats. We, we understand cat theology. If you weren't here last week, cat theology is more, you know, when you come home, this, this is the standard. I'm going to be broad brushy, where, where the cat will be there when you get home. Poor over poor on the, on, the, on the bench waiting for you. Where have you been? Where have you been? I've been here all day. Waiting, sleeping. I want my dinner. And they, then you give them a the dinner and, they, and they, is there not something better than that, than tuna? Tuna again, you know? And there's no pursuit left in the cat. Unless, unless the lizard's flying across the room where they see a mouse, then they get excited. But 
It's a, it's a sense of entitlement, of expectation. I'm being hard on cats. Sorry, cat lovers. Forgive. I'm being broad brush. I'm illustrating. Then there's the dog theology of people where the master comes home and it's like, you're home. Oh, I just, I love it when you're home. I've been waiting for you all day. See, I've done my poop in the corner where it's supposed to be out in the garden. I've, I've, I've behaved myself. It's been fine. But I just want to be with you. I'm not going to talk about food. I just want fellowship with the master. And everyone loves a good dog. Hey? Bad dogs are horrible, got to say. But a good dog, hey, Garden of Eden, I'm sure there was a dog in the Garden of Eden. A big, happy, labrador looking thing or a cavalier, beautiful, soft eyes, love the master stuff. Dog theology. And there's this sense of desire that is just somehow missing in our life. If we try to plug God into the side of our life, in the sense of, well, I've squared that one away. I've given my heart to Christ. I've placed my faith in Jesus. You know, and it's like nothing else to pursue here. And, I, and we, can, we can adopt cat theology and go, well, bring it. Um, it's, or if you don't, I'll, I'll go and find other things to be interested in life because I've got that important thing squared away. It's there. It's fine. I'm not moving away from that, but there's no sense of what, what do I pursue now? What do I chase? And the human heart, many of us are built for pursuit, but particularly the, 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 the males, if I can be that black and white. If there's not a mountain to climb, it's like, what's my walking stick for? It's like, uh, if, there's, if there's not something to get nerdy about, what am I doing? I'm just bored stiff. I'm deactivated, you know, and, and it's like we just go to sleep. Um, I know we can't be as that, that binary these days. We have to talk in more, you know, embracing terms, but we used to be able to get away with this 10 years ago, but not, but not so much now, you know, and so, but we lack this desire, and, and we become Christians, and it's like we've been hanging around for a while now, but it's like, yeah, but footy's on today, you know, the finals are on, soccer's in town, and we'll be prepared to pay a much higher price to do that than we are prepared to pay a price to be in God's house. Psalm 27.4, David had a few things to be obsessed about. He had a few things on his plate. He was running the most powerful nation of his day. But he comes back and says, one thing have I desired, that I'm going to seek, that I'll dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. This guy, he killed people recreationally. He was a barbarian. But one thing his heart desired, he never lost this, to pursue God, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. He, was, he had dog theology going on. He was just, I just love being with the master. And so this series on desire is to maybe just help us get a reset because in all of my years, I've never seen a world so distracting as this, so many choices to make about what matters. And if we've just squared God away, if we've got church in a box, then all of those things are going to seem incredibly attractive and they're going to truncate my experience of God. They're certainly going to combat my desire for his house and for what really matters. And the irony about this whole idea about pursuing God for us Christians is that, and this is what trips us up, is that he's everywhere all the time. So it's not like, we're talking about pursuing God. Yeah, but pursue him. He's right here all the time. How do I pursue that? Specifically with us, within the believer, in the, with, merging in the spirit with you and I who've placed our faith in Christ. So proximity isn't the only factor about pursuit. It's not that he's far away. It's not that God isn't with us. The only question is, is my heart with him? And that's what pursuit, that's what David's talking about here. My heart wants to be engaging with him. So how do we get to that place? So for all those who've been guessing what, what the D is, the D is devotion. Devotion. This is the first part of the journey to desiring God. So I want to unpack this whole idea about devotion. A devoted person has their heart set on God. Now, I remember as a young man before I'd had any exposure at all to Christians, my first exposure to the idea of Christianity was my flatmate, who was sort of, bless his soul, a bit of a drifted away guy who'd been brought up in church. And he went, he was chasing some Christian girls because Christian girls were the good girls to chase um, because you knew they weren't chasing anyone else. So, you know what I mean? There was this little window into the soul of a young man. Get hold of a Christian girl because they, they stay faithful to you. 
So he was off doing that because he knew from his experience Christian girls were the ones to get. And he went to a camp, uh, a Christian camp. I'd never heard of such a thing. We used to fix up cars and do stuff on weekends. This guy went to a camp. I said, where you go? He said, you don't need to know. Yeah. Anyway, he got back and, and uh, for some reason I, 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 he'd left a document that had come from the camp on the dining room table of this house that we were renting, you know. And I snuck a peek at this document. What's he been on about this weekend? It was his notes from the camp. And it was a really interesting questions that were quite normative to people like you and I or, or those who have been around church a little while, They're talking about devotion to Christ, that you give your whole heart, soul and mind to this single thing, your relationship with God. And this was his youth group camp. I went, what does that mean? Like in my mind, are you kidding? This is, this is what a cult looks like. This is wild. How could, how could a human being be devoted to this God that we can't see. And I looked at it and I, I didn't know. It was so confronting for me. I just thought, I, I can't relate to this at all. This is, you can only be doing this to impress a girl. Like who would say this stuff? Because he didn't live like it at the time. We were doing the same stuff, you know. And um, I, I tried to raise a conversation with him. He didn't want to go there. And, and, was, and the whole thing got paused for a while. But within 12 months, I'd become one of these crazy things called a Christian. Because the youth group that he started visiting with all these good-looking Christian girls, I started going up there too to see what was so interesting and um, didn't meet a girl, met, met this evangelist guy. And he told me the gospel and I, got, I became a Christian because I thought, you've got to be crazy not to do this, you know. And, and then I found myself reconsidering that page that I thought was so far from plausible reality. And it had, it had gone from being incomprehensible to being... That's an inconsequential price to pay. My whole heart, my whole soul, absolutely. Everything, not a problem at all. There's nothing else that matters more than this idea of Christ. So I'd gone in one year, I'd gone from a green banana that was not ripe at all to the faithful to a yellow ripe banana that was ready for plucking, you know. It's like this journey of the Spirit took me to this place of devotion that made no sense to anyone else. And there was something about that that we have to be able to embrace to say, if I'm going to embrace devotion the way God describes devotion, it's not going to look like anything that's going to be acceptable to the world. It's going to look a little bit weird. It could look a little bit fanatical. But the, what, what he describes as normal is very different to what we describe as normal. But I've got to ask myself repeatedly, just as all of us probably should, am I prepared to be fully devoted to Christ? Am I prepared to do that? A number of years ago, I was leading a men's group and uh, there was about 40 guys uh, that had started coming along and, and were in there, but I, and I was, that was great, but it seemed to be lacking a bit of zeal. And I, I used to like John 6, Jesus' idea of building a team is, is you, you, you thin the crowd a little bit. You, you, you want to set the temperature high in it, you probably need less people in the room and start with the real zealots. You know? So I, I thought, I'm going to challenge some of these guys about their faith, very unlike Pat, you know, just let's set the bar sky high. And so I wanted to thin the crowd a little bit. So I, I did communion, a, a night of communion. We just did communion now. And I, and I, and I, I want to tell this story after we did communion uh, and you'll, you'll see why. So when I did communion for this bunch of guys, and I want to parents, I need to frame this well because there's a, a spirit of offence may rise up at this. But I, I bought uh, along, I think, five bottles of the best Shiraz I could find. Now, Parenthetically, it was a controlled environment. It wasn't a public environment. I wasn't condoning alcoholism. There was no one in the room who struggled with alcoholism. We had no religious reason why we couldn't do this, okay? And I wasn't get the heart of what I was trying to do here. It was, it was these guys were all, they all liked a little drop of red. I knew that because I found out. So, there, so all night, they're looking at the bottles of red out the front. I said, okay, fellas, before we go any further, let's have communion. Um, and I had some nice glasses there. I said, can you drink of this cup? And they're all going, you know what we can drink of this. Not a problem. Is that all we get? And they were prepared to drink. Why? Because it was going to taste nice. It was valuable. It was good to partake. It was, it was going to be an enjoyable experience for them. So that before I let them do that, I read out Mark 10, 37 to 38, where James and John, they haven't got the bravery to come to Jesus and do it themselves, but they... they get their mother to lobby for them to Jesus. We want you to do anything we want. <laughs> What's that, he says, you know. Oh, we want to be at the left and right of you in your glory. Oh, not much, I see. And you know, Jesus just says, you, know, you guys have got no idea 
what you're asking. Can you, and his retort was, can you drink the cup I drink? Can you drink this suffering that I'm going to go through? Because that's what I'll be expecting. Can you single-mindedly resolve yourself to the calling that I have for you at whatever the cost? Are you fully devoted like I'm devoted to you? Can you drink of this cup? So guys, again, guys, can you drink of this cup? Very hesitant now. Because if you drink of this cup, I'm going to ask you to lay everything in your life on the table. Don't come out here if you're not going to do that. That's how you thin a crowd. They didn't all come out the front. I took a few bottles home to someone else's house. The question in their heart was, let me first consider this because this is different. And I guess I'm wanting us to consider this. Because our experience of God is going to be completely and, and proportionally tied to our level of desire for him. But this choice of devotion comes down to value. What do I really value? Because we can't value Christ and say we're putting him first if we, if we put him in the sideline because we've got it squared away and we're now pursuing every other thing in life. Jesus said it this way in a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then his joy went. In his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. So obviously with parables, there's a hidden truth here. He's hiding something for us to seek out. And the hidden thing is that the most valuable thing, the most valuable thing will inherently require us to devalue the other things. If we're going to value Christ, and we've got to justify, is this legit yet? Let's, we'll go there in a moment. But if I'm going to value him, if I'm going to be devoted to him the way the Bible describes it, then I'm going to have to devalue every other thing. There's no competition. God inherently, in his nature, cannot and will not compete with, with our other desires. He won't shout about it. He shouldn't have to. Why? Because he's Lord. He's preeminent, part of his nature is that he's, he is first, preeminent. He is above all things. And so in his nature, he can't compete about that because it's not who he is. He is first. That's all he is. He's first. So let's talk about devotion for a moment, the true meaning of devotion, because it's been muddled and there's different colours to it these days. Devotion can be heartfelt yearning. But when I say that, you might be thinking of romance novels and and. Uh, Olivia Newton-John singing hopelessly devoted to you, to, you know, something like that. And it can be that, but it's more than that. It's more than heartfelt yearning. Because not all of us are heartfelt yearning people. So it has to be more than that. It can be consistent effort. We, we talk about people being devoted to sport and so on. It's con- they're devoted to their sport, consistent effort for something that really matters to them. And, and so, yes, it can be that. It can be heartfelt yearning, consistent effort, but it's more than that. It can be a clear focus. So I'm devoted to this one thing. So it's clear. It's in my heart. I'm yearning for it. It's consistent effort and I'm clear. There's this one thing. Absolutely. So that all fits. But it's more than that. It means that you're, in a biblical sense, to being devoted to Christ means I've offered up my life without condition. I'm devoted singly to him. There's no competition. And in that sense, when we are about that with Christ, we, it's not just that we're giving over. This, this load is light. It's essentially a lot lighter than this load that we have of every other thing that we're devoted to, every other thing that demands our time and our performance. This load is light. It's singular. Look at what Peter says after he's processed this whole thing through through his life. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We belong to him. When you, when you sign on the dotted line, you check the box, yes, I'm a Christian. What that means is we, we belong to Christ. Paul adopted that term. So that, so we're not just giving ourselves over, we give ourselves over so that you may proclaim the excellency, excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So we we give ourselves over to one single thing and that qualifies us to be the ones who declare to present the greatness of God. So let's have a few points about devotion. 
the, the consequences of this are pretty huge. Devotion to God requires a degree of exclusivity. If I'm devoted to God, I'm devoted to only God. And, and we, this is something we do need to square away. Because I know each one of us, including myself, have things coming at us every day that will compete for our desires. Sometimes they're things that are worthy. Most of the time they're things that are worth doing. Otherwise we wouldn't do them. We're predominantly value-driven people. So it's not like they're useless. It's the good things that trap us. It's the good things that take us and take us too far. But there's this whole idea of exclusivity to God because we are a people that are his own possession. So nothing else is allowed to own us. Nothing else is allowed to tug at us or influence the decisions of our heart. This is why James, and James just has a knack of saying everything in a negative, offensive way. But he says, you adulterous people, don't you know friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It's like black, white, make your choice. He's inferring there that nothing else belongs in the heart of someone who loves God. There's things that they're all part of life that we have to deal with, but it doesn't get its place in our heart. Very confronting. God won't mix his devotion. It's all or nothing. That's the way it's got to be. You know, I've seen a lot of miracles in my life. I've seen the power of God do incredible things, and I've never yet seen I've never yet seen this, a person who wholeheartedly pursues God and his grace and his power, who gives their life over to him in the pursuit of what he's defined as what really about. I've never once seen someone do that and in, within 24 months seen them working in the power of God in their life in a miraculous way. Anyone who pursues God and his grace and his power, give, give it time, let it, let it work through your heart, let it change your routine to see miracles on a fairly regular basis. And yeah, people will come to me and, and with questions about that because that's not their experience. So I never hear God. I've never seen God work. All I'm left with is my own logic about this thing and my own trust that somehow he's there because I don't know anything different. And yet somebody with a stronger argument can come in and threaten that and convince them that he doesn't. So they want to, they want to know God's power. They want to hear him speak into their life, to have the clarity of that, to be able to lay hands on someone that they love dearly and see them risen from their sickness. You know, interestingly, I gave a story last week for those who weren't here about a woman who'd been cured of depression in a very difficult life situation. Uh, Another couple of people from this church came and said, that that happened to me too at the same time. That there are people here today who experienced in this, as they entered into this pursuit of God without condition, something transformed in their life that had been hanging around them for years and years and years. Suddenly their mindset changes to devotion and suddenly Access to God's power comes into their life. Matthew 5.3, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. You want, do you not want to see God? Would you not like to meet him in a more powerful way? To have him ruin your day because now none of it matters except him anymore. To know he can answer any prayer that in this room God can do anything and probably will and that's just a normal part of life. Wouldn't we all just love more of that? Blessed are the pure in heart for they should see God. And when Jesus came, this was the devotion he expected. He never set the bar lower than this. He never dialed it down because diluted desire brings a diluted experience of God. Half-hearted devotion brings half-hearted revelation. And this is... We shouldn't see this as a, as a heavier load. This is freedom. This is cutting off the ties that everything else in our life has to us. The things that cause us depression, the things that cause us, you know, anxiety and performance measurement and self-criticism and all that stuff. It frees us of all that. This isn't a begrudged sacrifice to full devotion. It's so freeing. It's so simple. It's so life-giving and it's so powerful. It's the devil's nightmare because he's got nothing on you because you're already dead to the world. You're fully alive to God. In his parable, he said, in in his joy, the man sold all that he had. What was he offering? What is this pearl of great price? It's life with God. He wasn't, the pearl of great price wasn't the fact that he gets saved and goes to heaven one day. That wasn't the mindset that Jesus ministered in. He ministered in this idea of kingdom. It wasn't a gospel of salvation. Salvation's included. It was a gospel of the kingdom. 
Kingdom life now. Heaven coming to earth now. As it is up there, bring it down here. Experiencing that now. It was an invitation to life and everything else. And for them, it was contrasted against all that they knew, which was judgment and hardship and starvation and punishment and meaninglessness and temporal life. He's saying, this kingdom that I'm offering you, it's a pearl of great price. Do anything, sell everything, die if you have to, but get this. And they were prepared to do that. But it's contrasted for us now as well, this pearl of great price between the triviality of life, of anxiety, of purposelessness, all that sort of stuff. He's offering us a pearl of great price. Second point, devotion means we switch modes in our life from ownership to stewardship. You realise if I'm devoted, I've given myself over. I'm still breathing. I'm still here. I've still got choices. But now it's a calling of stewardship, not ownership. Nothing in my life is actually mine alone to own. I belong to God first, my family, my family in Christ. That's it. Nothing else should matter. I'm stewarding my life based on that reality. We don't own our life and then donate some to God. You're not doing God any favours if you're giving him your spare cash. Don't do that. It's God first. That's why I don't nag you about this. I don't manipulate or coerce about this stuff. God's first. If God's first in our life, we'll have no shortage of anything around here and neither will you in your life. Because your agendas will change. Your priorities will change. You'll always have enough time. You'll always have everything you need. God's first. We see life differently, purpose, energy, ambition. It's all his. It's all for his kingdom. And I get to play in that sandpit with him. There's nothing like it. So it clarifies, it simplifies everything about our life. It becomes about the family enterprise with God. But the early scriptures gave us a template about this whole idea of devotion. Leviticus 27 is introduced. Nothing that a person owns and devotes to the Lord, whether a human being or an animal or a family land, may be sold or redeemed. Everything so devoted is most holy to the Lord. In other words, once it's given, you can't take it back. It's, it's devoted. And they had devoted things. And, and, and not long after this, uh, there was a, a passage, um, I think it's in Deuteronomy, about Achan's no, it's in Joshua. Achan's plunder, Joshua 7. There's, there's Holy Spirit memory for you. Achan's plunder. Because everything that they took from the lands that they conquered was to be devoted to God. And Achan decides victimless crime. No one's going to know. He tucks a little bit in his tent, buries it in a hole. Suddenly there's no victories happening. Everyone's going, what's going on? Where's God? We're all doing the right thing. And God says, the things that were devoted to me have been stolen from me. You've stolen them from me. What? Oh, so heads up, if, if we're devoting our life to Christ, he owns, our, he owns us now. We're stewarding what's, what's his. Anyone confronted you? <laughs> like I'm unbelievably confronted by this message. This is, this is radical Christianity, but it's the only Christianity that the Bible talks about. If you have life devoted to God, your ambition is going to be about the kingdom coming. And that doesn't nullify the call that we have to live in balance and health. So I'm not saying get yourself out of kilter here. It's not saying that, that our kids aren't to be nurtured and provided for. It's not saying we don't invest in our health and well-being because that's stewardship of our body. It's stewardship of our family. He wants us to know love and good relationships, but the foundation of it all is devotion. See, those things like our families and our health and all that kind of stuff, they're not the issues that need correcting right now. We're, as a society, we're doing pretty well there. The value's gone up and all those things and we, and we know how to manage our life. But somehow in the managing of all that, the general theme seems to be that we've lost our devotion to God as a, as a culture. Not in this church, understandably. Everywhere else, it seems to be like that. Devotion is something that needs to be, the temperature needs to go up on this, absolutely. The trouble with all of us, all of us, is that devotion drifts. We've made our commitment. We've set our heart aside, but devotion does tend to drift in our life. Why is that? Because life accumulates activity uh, and distraction. The early commitment that we made are great and it's what we should have done, but now it seems to be insufficient because life becomes bigger, doesn't it? The bowl of all the stuff that we manage, of the kids and the families and the jobs and the career and all the stuff that I have to do just to live, those pressures and those demands come in. 
the life that gets derailed because it's not going right, all that kind of stuff. It's just the load gets big. And as a young adult, you know, we've placed our life courageously on the line and go, yes, God, I'm in, all in. Man, you haven't got that much to give, to be honest, when you're a young ad. You know, it's like, go for it. So we do that. But we think now we've done that. And so, but that devotion stagnates and doesn't match the tide of life that keeps coming in. And, and we find that the whole let go and let God thing that used to work every single time doesn't seem to work for us all the time now. So we, we pick up the reins a bit. We think, well, God's not doing all the stuff I need him to do, so I'll respond in my own strength. And so we get this habit of doing stuff in our own strength and soon enough we find ourselves in a place where we're nowhere. Because for now, for years, maybe decades, we've just been banking on this devotion that we gave to Christ early on that didn't need to change. But now I'm doing it all on my own strength and now I'm just turning up on Sunday as normal, but... I'm silently got all this stuff going on inside my head, questions, doubts. Is it worth it? Where am I going? Oh, the rugby's on. Let's go to that. And so we may even question this God that we committed to once, and our life becomes a hollow shell of Christianity. It looks good. No one would know. But you're battling. You're battling all the time because the, 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 the devotion has drifted. And it's not only you and me. The wisest have always gone through this. Solomon was a, a great tale of this, too long for me to read, the many chapters devoted to this. But his, his father, David, who gave us the one thing of I desired talk, you know, he, he gave his son a talking to it before he passed away and said, you've got to, if you want to pull this thing off, this greatest role of all time to lead this nation, you've got to be wholly devoted to God. It's all or nothing. You've got to give it all to him. And Solomon, great young man, I'm going to do this. There's, no, there's nothing threatening that in his life. So he does that and God meets him in incredible ways. What is it you want, Solomon? Oh, I just want to lead God's people well, you know. Fantastic answer. I'm going to give you that and I'm going to give you everything else, you know. And he goes on through life. But in 1 Kings 11, it talks about the, the way he entered the game and, and the, the drifted devotion. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. And we're not going to blame the wives here, you know. Um, he, he, he was the captain of his own soul. It's talking there about the distractions, the other agendas, the culture that he was prepared to embed himself in there. There was a relentless worldly influence at play. And maybe we have a bunch of wives in that sense, all the things that are, that are in our ear all the time about what matters most. Turn the news on, you know. It'll tell you what, what they think should matter to you. I turned on Channel 7 for a minute yesterday. It's always a mistake. It never ends well. And I thought, oh, the news will be on. Surely there'll be some news today. There hasn't been anything on there for the last 25 years, but maybe today's the day, you know. And, and what's on? Aussie rules. Anyone like Aussie rules? I've never understood it, to be honest. I've never grasped it because I, I, I look for order. You know what I mean? I'm a motor racing guy. It's precise. It does what it's supposed to do. Me, go, and you, you alter the dials and the thing works. But Aussie rules, it's like, oh, they're all going. They're, 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 they're incredibly impressive specimens of human beings, though, aren't they? I mean, these guys are, think, man, if I was a woman, that'd be like, wow, these guys are, you know, I, I know why the girls watch. I don't know why the guys watch. Uh, but I thought, okay, there's got to be something in this game. So I'm watching it yesterday. Trish said, what are you doing? I'm watching Aussie rules. Why? That's oh, a final. Apparently, it matters, you know double header or something going on and, and one team, uh, St Kilda, was being slaughtered by um, Greater Western Sydney, I think it was, which, oh, they're my team. I'm, I'm, I'm from out that way. Uh, great, this will be interesting. And I'm watching and I'm thinking, it took me 10 minutes to figure out, oh, there is order to this game. Some guy kicks and every time someone catches it, if it's, if it's more than a couple of feet, the whistle blows and everyone goes, great catch. And then he's, he's got to try and kick it to someone else and they catch it. And then they kick it and miss and it's like, no worries, let's try that again. And then they're all wrestling and they fall over. What really impressed me was, this did impress me genuinely, is because I could relate to it, is these guys, all game, it's like the antithesis of soccer. You know in soccer, if you get, someone looks like they touch you, you fall over and scream and cry. These guys are whacking each other behind. They're, they're, they're paired up and they're, they're whacking each other and then smiling to each other about it. I'm thinking... He's got, nothing worries these men, hey. They're just like, boom, <laughs> do it again, mate. Boom, yeah, do it again. Is that all you got? I'm thinking, that's impressive. I'd probably cry, you know, <laughs> to have four quarters of that. Anyway, I, have, <laughs> I don't know how I got onto that. But 
I literally don't know where I was going with that. I beg your pardon, that's really bad. But um, let's get back to the notes. <laughs> Devotion drifts. When, <laughs> there was a reason behind that, and it was going, it was going to go somewhere. The thing about devotion, whatever it is, whether it's sport, whether it's whatever it is, it will lead you, it will draw you, and you'll find yourself becoming more passionate about the thing than the one that doesn't draw you, the one that you're not getting nerdy about, the one that's not in doubt, the one that's not under threat. And so with our devotion, we need to make our devotion decision. There's a moment where we become devoted, but we also need to manage our devotion because life grows, life gets more complex, so our devotion needs to grow with that. So it needs to be activated and it needs to be maintained. It needs to be formed and it needs to be fueled. And sometimes we need to activate devotion, sometimes we need to adjust our devotion. So in our own heart, I guess now, we need to, where am I at? Am I just a hollow shell? Like I, the, the devotion essentially, it went ages ago, I didn't even notice it would go on. Or am I just struggling? With the, if, do I feel that competition now? I guess that's the way to, to judge it. Am I feeling the competition of God and the world, am I feeling that or do I not feel that anymore? Because if I don't feel it anymore, I'm either fully devoted to Christ or something died a long time ago. So maybe you need to make a devoted decision or maybe you need to adjust your devotion. Sometimes devotion is so neglected it, it does stall and that requires a literally a come to Jesus moment because you deserve better than that and, and so does God. And these are radical moments, repentance, commitment, return to God. And I'm sure there'll be some of us in the room that me mentioning that, you know, you know that's you. And you don't own that decision to me. That's between you and the Lord, but maybe it will help you today. Because I know when I've had to make those decisions again, I've had to come down the front, not to man, to God, to kneel, start again. The forgiveness is already there but I need to make a decision of complete devotion. So perhaps you need to do that and you know it. Perhaps this is your day. Or maybe you just need to incrementally adjust your devotion to God. This is fueling your devotion so it keeps up with life. And they call these acts of devotion where we do things in our life that we somehow let slip and, we, and they're, they're actions of devotion, things like our quiet time. That's what they're called, devotions. Did you know that? That's what a devoted person does. They start their day with Jesus, time with him. And the thing about devotion and, and ensuring that we do what devotion requires, it's things like how, how am I stewarding my resources, how am I stewarding my time, how am I stewarding my affections, all those things. Devotion in itself is not going to actually change anything about your circumstance. It's not going to change the world around you. All these things are going to keep bombarding us. It's just a matter of, uh, they're in the world and I'm in the world, but are they in me? But devotion sets you up to change the world. This is why it's number one on this, this list. A growing desire to God starts with devotion. If we haven't got a sense of devotion where I'm wholly his, the rest of this isn't going to make sense and I will have thinned the crowd severely and there'll be like 15 people here next week. We have to square this one away, guys. It's, it's my job to confront the idols in this world. There might not be much that I do well. There may, my communication may be fluid and all the other things with it, but, but I will not relent on confronting the idols that are coming against you, the things that we bow to in our life. There's only one God. Someone has to say it, and we all need to question how we're responding to that. But if we can do this, it adds fuel in your life to the things that matter. It changes your compass heading, so suddenly you'll find yourself on a different trajectory different things you're worrying about, so that will change your life. It alters what you'll say yes to, what you say no to, and it has a cascading effect in your life where once this thing's decided over the weeks and months and years that follow, everything else begins to look different in your life and the things that once mattered don't matter anymore and it's a different life. And it's a simple life and it's a life of love and power. So the rest of our series is going to flesh this out in consequence to this decision. So can I pray with us now? This is your business with God. And if you are one of those people that you need to make a come to Jesus moment out of this, 
you please come down the front. We'll pray with you. I've made those decisions. I've done that. Let's pray. Father, what a holy moment. There is no moment bigger than this for an unbeliever to become a believer or a, a believer to grow in their devotion. Lord, we just can't escape the wonderful reality, the clarifying reality, the unconfusing reality that you are the preeminent God. There is no one like you. You've never let us down. You've always been faithful. You never give us a reason to doubt. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. You've been since before the beginning and you'll always be there. Lord, we just do pray for the forgiveness for if our hearts have drifted. But Lord, help us to square away right now. If you are Lord, are you Lord of all? Lord, show us if there's an idol in our life that we've been bowing to. If there's something that's been competing with this simple devotion to you. Lord, we make a devoted step in faith because we don't understand. We, have, we still have questions. There's still so many doubts in our mind. But, we, but regardless of all of that, we still know you're God. We still know you are who you say you are. We know that you've never let us down and we know that you've been prepared to pay any price to get us back and, and that you can't be any closer to us. So Lord, with that truth in who you are and what you've said, we set aside all the doubts. We set aside all the idols. And we cast our devotion and our affection, our desire to you. Lord, will you meet us in that place? And Lord, for, that, for empty hands that have released all those other things, will you fill them with your grace and your power and with faith to make the decisions in life today that devotion requires. In Jesus' name. Amen.